This presentation was recorded at the Best Practices for Pollinators Summit. For more information, contact pollinatorfriendly.org. Well, thanks for, for inviting me to speak. Um, and it's another, been another great um, summit this year, and um, I'm really happy to, to be here as part of it. So hello from Boulder, Colorado, a college town of about 100,000 that's located about 25 miles northwest of Denver at the foot of the Rocky Mountains. My name is Rella Abernathy, and I work as a senior ecologist for the City of Boulder's Climate Initiatives Department on the Nature-Based Climate Solutions team. So you might be wondering why a person is giving a talk about mosquito control at Pollinator Summit. And one answer to that question is that we know that some species of mosquitoes are pollinators, and it's likely that many others are too. And another reason is that some mosquito control practices can have direct impacts on pollinators and ecosystems. But one of the points that I hope to make today is that the very best of intentions can lead to unintended consequences, even when following the best management practices from the agencies and academic institutions that are considered the ultimate authorities. And those unintended consequences can have very real impacts on people's health and the integrity of the living world we all rely on. But before we dig into that, I'd like to take a few minutes um, to, to show you a little bit more about this fascinating group of insects, the mosquitoes. So most people hate mosquitoes and think of them as these vile bloodsuckers that have no real purpose. And whenever there are stories about mosquitoes in the news, you can pretty much count on seeing these photos or videos of people sticking their arms in laboratory cages to feed colonies. But this is actually a much more accurate representation of how mosquitoes feed. Um, almost all species use nectar as their energy source, and only the female mosquito will take a blood meal to get nutrients and protein she needs to produce eggs. And as a rule, mosquitoes feed on nectar the rest of the time, and for most species, the males do too. So most of the photos and fun facts that I'm going to show you in the next few slides are from two articles about wonderful mosquito biologists who study the beauty, diversity, and ecological importance of mosquitoes. And I, can't, I just can't recommend enough this article in the Smithsonian Magazine that features Yvonne Marie Linton's work, and it also has some amazing photographs and research from Lawrence Reeves, who's an entomologist at University of Florida. And this is another great article in the conversation by Dan Peach, who's now on the faculty of the University of Georgia, and he does all kinds of really interesting and exciting work on mosquitoes. So if you aren't familiar with the amazing diversity of these little creatures, you are in for a treat. They, there are at least 3,750 known species of mosquitoes and counting around the world. And as Yvonne Marie Linton says here, we have grossly we have been grossly underestimating the diversity of mosquitoes. The number of new mosquitoes that we find everywhere we go is phenomenal. Of the nearly 4,000 um, species of mosquitoes, just 100 are known to be vector di um, uh, vectors for disease. But the few species that do transmit diseases to humans have caused a devastating amount of illness and death to humans. With the 700,000 deaths from mosquito-borne illness each year, over half of those are, are from malaria, which is carried by Anopheles mosquitoes. But of the 430 species of uh, Anopheles, only 30 to 40 of those can transmit malaria. And of the 200 species that we've identified here in the US, we regularly, and um, only 12 of those are known um, to transmit pathogens or parasites. And our control efforts are mostly in the US focused on West Nile virus. In Colorado, we have 57 species identified, and we regularly catch around a dozen or so in our city traps. So mosquitoes have a long relationship with flowering plants, and mosquito diversity took off um, with the evolution of flowering plants. And we don't know a whole lot about the role in pollination, and mostly that's because it hasn't been well studied. But there are examples of both generalist and specialist um, pollinators that are mosquitoes. So this is an example of a pollinator specialist. Um, it's the snow pool mosquito. It pollinates the blunt leaf orchid, which blooms at the same time that the snow pool mosquito emerges. 
And when the mosquito takes a little drink of nectar, its head is just the right size to fit inside the orchid flower and it picks up these little pollen balls or pollinia that stick to its head and it carries on to the next orchid blunt flower. Like other insects, um, some mosquito species have evolved some pretty bizarre behaviors, which is why I love insects. And Dan Peach studied a mosquito that feeds on honeydew from sap sucking insects. And when an insect like an aphid is tapped into the phloem of a plant, they excre excrete sugary droplets out of their back end. And that's what we call honeydew. And insects like ants can uh, feed on honeydew and actually guard and farm the aphids. Um, Mosquitoes use the odor, can use odors, are really good at using odors to find cues for flowers and hosts, including us. And apparently they also use it to track these odors emitted by honeydew. And when they locate the ants, the mosquito strokes the ant's antenna and sticks her proboscis into the ant's mouth, inducing the ant to regurgitate honeydew. And they're even predaceous mosquitoes. I've heard this, the elephant mosquito referred to as the best mosquito because they feed, um, their larvae feed on other mosquitoes. And on the lower right side here, you can see the regular size mosquito larva is being eaten by this huge elephant mosquito larva. And the entire, their entire life cycle is really interesting. So if you like that kind of stuff, um, it's a good thing to look up. So mosquitoes come in all different shapes, sizes, and colors. And their host preferences for blood seeking um, varies widely too. Many species feed on birds and mammals, but there are some that feed on reptiles and even some on fish or worms. And there are all kinds of fascinating mating behaviors. And in this, the case of this guy here called the iridescent paddle mosquito, he not only has this incredible plumage on his legs, but he does a mating dance to attract females. There are even examples of mosquitoes that guard their young, and this is a hairy-lipped mosquito guarding her eggs until they hatch. So the ecological role of mosquitoes is critical um, around the, role, the globe for ecosystems, and they're an important food source for other insects and animals at every life stage. And they and other aquatic flies form the foundations of wetland food chains. So each species is different, and that's an important consideration that's often overlooked in mosquito control programs. Okay, which brings me to the topic of my talk today, which is about the risks from mosquito control practices, both to human health and ecosystems. And I feel like um, the mosquito management approach that we're using here at the city of Boulder to reduce West Nile um, virus risk can serve as a case study about how to develop a management program of any kind using, eco using ecosystem management principles. And this is the West, Vial the West Nile virus webpage of the CDC and almost all state and local government and agencies look to the CDC for guidance on how to protect the public from mosquito-borne disease. So the transmission cycle of West Nile virus is actually much more complicated than this diagram, but people and horses can get West Nile from being bitten by an infected mosquito, and we're what's called a dead-end host which means that West Nile um, transmission only goes one way from mosquitoes to us, and we aren't a source of West Nile for mosquitoes. Birds are the main host, though some mammals can be hosts too, and birds not only get West Nile from mosquitoes, but mosquitoes can pick it up from birds. So once West Nile is high enough levels in bird and insect populations, bird and mosquito populations, uh, the levels can build up quickly and amplify, which, is increasing, which increases the number of mosquitoes and the risk for transmission to people. So each species, whether it's a bird, a mammal, or a mosquito, has different levels of vector competency or the ability for a virus, for them to pick up a, a virus and replicate it so it can be transmitted. And all players in this can also develop immunity to the virus, and of course, viruses mutate. So this is a very complex cycle. And remember, all mosquitoes are not the same. All species aren't the same. And so this is a very general classification that um, for our purposes of talking about mosquito management. Um, well, so we're looking at mosquitoes in two rough categories. So vector mosquitoes are the mosquitoes that can be, become infected with and transmit West Nile virus. And Culex um, mosquitoes lay their eggs on water in these little rafts. Mosquitoes that bite people but don't um, transmit disease are nuisance mosquitoes. And the majority of nuisance mosquitoes in our areas are floodwater mosquitoes. They lay their eggs on mud and their eggs dry out, which you can see in these photos. 
So mosquitoes are flies and all flies go through complete metamorphosis. So on the left is a, the life cycle for mosquitoes like Culex that lay their eggs directly on water. And on the right are delayed hatching or floodwater mosquitoes. Their eggs dry out and can build up over, over time like a seed bank in the soil, sometimes for years. And then once an area becomes um, inundated with water, the eggs reconstitute and hatch. And once they hatch, the larvae have to remain in the water to complete their life cycle. So if a site, if site dries out at this point, it'll kill them just like it would a culex larva. And when there's a big rain event in the spring that saturates a large area, you can get a synchronous emergence of floodwater mosquitoes leading to a huge spike. They can be aggressive biters and some species can travel miles and miles, like up to 25 miles beyond the site where they emerge. We often see culex and floodwater mosquitoes at same sites. And so the floodwater mosquitoes hatch in the water and then the culex females come along and lay their eggs at these wet sites. So it may seem like lots of rain would mean more mosquitoes and therefore a higher risk of West Nile virus. But this study looked at West Nile virus and climatic data and, and from several states to determine what the drivers are for what human cases. And one of the states they analyzed in depth was Colorado. So when West Nile first arrived in 2003, we were one of the hardest hit states. And this study found that drought and immunity were the main drivers for human cases in Colorado. So drought increases the risk and immunity decreases the risk. And drought may not seem to make that much sense because culex lay their eggs on water. But when it's droughty, it's thought that birds that are the main host and mosquitoes will be more concentrated around water and the odds of coming into contact with each other to spread West Nile um, seems higher. When immunity has to do with the way that West Nile virus infection manifests in people. So when a person's bitten by an infected mosquito, 80% of people won't have symptoms at all and won't even know they were infected. But after being exposed, they become immune. And since Colorado is an outdoorsy state, there are likely many people who are now immune since West Nile is endemic and, the, and is always present, um, present in the summer at some level. So most of the 20% of people who get infected with what's called West Nile fever have flu-like symptoms ranging from mild to severe, and they become immune. The, but the reason we care so much about this disease is because a, a few people who are infected, about one in 150, will develop neuroinvasive diseases that cause encephalitis, meningitis, or a polio-like um, illness called flaccid paralysis. And these people become very ill. They, it can be fatal, and people who survive can suffer from life-changing disabilities. And thankfully, most mosquitoes aren't infected with West Nile. First, you know, the culex are just part of the mosquitoes out there. And then only between 2 to 8% of mosquitoes are usually infected. But since people can get sick if they get the neuroinvasive form of the disease, public health officials take this disease very seriously. And unlike the flu or COVID, West Nile can be prevented by taking precautions to avoid being bitten by mosquitoes, which is why education is so important. So I want you to pay attention to the shape of this graph. Um, the first year West Nile arrived, arrived in Colorado is zero on the axis, the x-axis. And at that point, no one was immune. And then in that year, we had over 3,000 cases in the state, but it dropped off in successive years. And this graph shows neuroinvasive um, cases, but the shape um, is similar. And when we, when we, if, it, if they were plotting just human cases, and what's interesting about this study is that they ran um, climate and epidemiological models for different scenarios. And these symbols past the dotted line are future projections for human risk. M is for mean and E is for extreme. And they predicted that although um, there will continue to be cases that they didn't expect an epidemic. So the rest of this talk, I'm gonna focus on Boulder County. And this map of Colorado shows you where we're located. So I don't know if you can see also, here, if you can see my cursor is the area that we're talking about. Here's the border um, of Boulder County and um, about two thirds of the county is in the mountains. So we're really focusing on um, this area um, and that's um, on the, in the front range, the western or the eastern front range. And these areas that are yellow, shaded in yellow and blue are larval breeding sites that are mapped um, um, that we visit regularly inspect at the city. Okay. And I also wanted to point out that we have um, 
we have 45,000 acres of open space land in the ring around the city, and that's why we have all these sites um, that are on um, grasslands, ag lands, and wetlands. So this is a chart um, of human cases in all of Boulder County, County from 2003 to last year. And above each bar denotes number of deaths. So if you remember what that graph looks like from the study, the pattern is similar. You now we had the, the big um, a, a number of cases in 2003, and then it dropped down and it stayed relatively low. Um, and since the health department relies on physicians um, to report West Nile viruses and the test, and then they also have an investigator go out and confirm them. And, and West the the and, and the the twenty percent of people have West Nile fever have really similar symptoms to the flu. We may we may not have the best reporting for those cases, but we do have decent reporting, of course, for neuroinvasive cases and for deaths. Now, this is for all cases in Colorado. And you can see kind of um, towards the end that they're starting to rise a little bit again. But this is what's really alarming. This is like a plot of deaths. Um, and as you can see, I don't know if you guys are covered up by um, and by the by me and um, the other presenters, but it goes up to 50 this last year, which is almost as high as it was when we initially you know had a had the epidemic in in 2003. Now we can see your whole slide roll up. Okay, excellent. So the, the best method that we have um, to estimate the risk is by of, of West Nile is by trapping mosquitoes. And we, we set these traps overnight and they have a light source in the carbon dioxide source, which attract female mosquitoes looking for a blood meal. And the mosquitoes are then keyed to species and counted. And the Culex mosquitoes from Sentinel traps are tested for West Nile virus infection. The population of Culex mosquitoes and the infection rate are used to calculate a value called the vector index. And 0.75 is the threshold that predicts that human cases are likely to occur. So let's look at the vector index values in Boulder County for the last three years when we're starting to see human cases increase. And we'll start with 2021. So the Boulder County Health Department has a mosquito control district and divides the county into three zones. The city of Boulder isn't part of that district, so we design and manage our own program and test our own mosquitoes. Um, so here are the breeding sites on, on um, on city-owned property again down here to give you a reference. And the county inspects and treats mosquito larvae on their own properties and trap mosquitoes and spray neighborhoods and unincorporated areas outside the, lim the city limits. So Boulder County Zone 1 is part of the mosquito district and not the city. And that would is mainly the areas over here towards the west side of the county. Okay, Zone 2 is I'm going, to try, I'm going to show you the cursor is up here in and around Longmont, which is a city that is northeast of Boulder. And zone three is this eastern area um, that's over here and that's Superior Louisville, Lafayette and Erie, which is hiding under this one map. So all three of these charts have the same scale on the X index, I mean the X axis to make it easier to compare. And the green box um, signifies the 0 0.05 threshold. So once the vector index reaches that point, you know, it's likely that enough people will get infected that we'll start seeing human cases. So here's Boulder. Um, and you can see um, that we didn't ever exceed the, 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 point zero, the 0 0.75 threshold. And each, we, we test once a week. Um, and so we did have um, some positive mosquitoes during three weeks, but the, the, light, the rate was pretty low. Okay, let's look and see what happened in 2022. So once again, we see multiple weeks in values exceeding 0.75, sometimes by quite a lot. And these four charts are also scaled with each other for comparison. In that particular year, and um, the city of Boulder had no positive tests the whole season. Now let's look at um, 2023, and here we see some of the highest vector index index values I've ever even heard of. So the highest um, in 2022 was 3.52, and in 2021 was 5.03, which felt crazy at the time. 
but this last year there was one over 15. Um, I have the data for the county since they share it with other with all the municipalities, but the vector index numbers, some of them that I saw throughout the state were very high. And there were some of the highest trap numbers and the largest number of culics that I've ever seen in some of these other areas. So here in Boulder, we had high mosquito numbers too, but not nearly as high as other areas. And our culix numbers never came close, I mean, by orders of magnitude to nearby cities. And we never exceeded the vector index. So the big question is why is there a difference um, between the city and the other jurisdictions? And what's crazy about last year was this unseasonably wet year for us, so drought was not a factor. But before I start talking about the difference between the city's approach and the other cities and counties in Colorado, I wanna say this. I started working for the city 15 years ago and part of my job was managing the mosquito program. And so this was in 2009. So I was just six years past the West Nile epidemic. And although there were still some human cases, eight of, the, eight of the next nine years, no one died in the whole county. But there's always this fear that there could be a bad West Nile year. And the weight is heavy on your shoulders as someone running a program when you worry that the decisions you make can affect somebody else. So I just wanna make it clear that when the other cities are following the guidance of CDC and the state and county health departments, they are doing what they feel is the very best they can do to protect the public. Okay, so let's um, start with all the, pro what, all the all that we have in common between the programs before we look at the difference. So we all set up traps and test for West Nile. We all map and inspect larval breeding sites and we all spend time educating the public. There is one difference in how we inspect our larval sites. Um, the city has kept data on the density of mosquito larvae at each of our over 500 sites going back to 2002 when we created our program. And it just so happens that skilled field techs can tell the difference between culex and other mosquito larvae. So culex are on the bottom and mosquito larvae don't have gills, so they have to come up to the surface of the uh, water to get air. And culex have this long angled siphon on their back ends. It's like a snorkel. And this 80s larva looks different at the left. Um, so it's the, even when they're tiny and younger instars, a, a skilled field tech or ecologist can tell the difference. So we have all of this data tracked for over 20 years of larval data for every site every week for both culex and non-culex mosquitoes. So here's integrated mosquito management, or, um, or, IM, or IMM from the CDC. Public education, involvement, and evaluating actions are important and something that we do too. But notice that IMM includes controlling nuisance mosquitoes, and nuisance mosquitoes don't carry disease. There's a reason why the city IDs um, Culex larvae in the field, and I'll explain why in a bit. And this is a pretty major assumption that these methods are safe and effective because first, mosquito populations continue to rise. One study showed as much by tenfold in the last 50 years. And the other zones in the county used every tool they had at their disposal to try to lower numbers when, in, in West Nile infection when it was rising. So what does it mean to control mosquitoes at all life stages? Okay, there's an insecticide for every life stage. Adulticides are broad spectrum insecticides that are fogged from trucks or sprayed on vegetation. This includes trees, grasses, and plants from backpack sprayers. Some people use organophosphates like nailid or malathion, but I think that only pyrethroids are used in Boulder County. So pyrethroids are incredibly toxic to both aquatic and terrestrial invertebrates and associated with a whole suite of issues in people, including cognitive issues in kids and reproductive issues in adults. And PFAS has been um, detected in Anvil, one of the adulticide products, and the initial thought was that it leached from the plastic container. But PFAS is also purposely added to products. Until the last few months, the EPA was allowing PFAS additives and pesticide formulations. But what most people don't realize is that active ingredient of many pesticides are actually PFAS themselves. And the pyre uh, pyre uh, one of the pyrethroids that's used for mosquito control by fenthrin, including here in Boulder County, is a PFAS. So this is um, a page from the Minnesota Department of Ag's website showing been um, bifenthrin listed as PFAS. And I pulled out bifenthrin, but this list contains many insecticides and herbicides that are applied everywhere across the country. And the chemical industry is lobbying to challenge and limit the definition for PFAS, these fluorinated chemicals. 
but fluorinated chemicals are the, are the norm now in new pesticides. And the Scientific American article points out that over 70% of new pesticide products are these forever chemicals. And do they even work? Um, this estimate from David Pimentel shows that 0.000001% of adulticide droplets even hit a mosquito. And last season, as West Nile was rising, other jurisdictions sprayed every week for weeks. The threshold they used to spray for nuisance mosquitoes normally is 150 per trap. And some of these sprayed areas had traps week after week with thousands of mosquitoes, including thousands of Culex. So mosquitoes not only become resistant to insecticides, but they learn to avoid them as they, as we, and as we get more heat spikes, in some cases they can become less sensitive. There are also studies showing different pesticides um, affect the, the infection of pathogens in mosquitoes or the ability of them become infected. There are just, a, these are just um, a couple of multiple papers on the ecological impacts that pyrethroids, bifenthrin and permethrin have on aquatic ecosystems. And surface soils are often used for later um, larval instars and pupae. And surface film products are non-selective. They're lethal to all surface breathing insects, including may flies, aquatic beetles, and bugs, and they are known to Im impact duck eggs. Insect growth regulators like methoprene, which is a synthetic analog of juvenile hormone, is applied to water. And juvenile hormone is common to all insects, as insects grow mold that keeps them in an immature stage. And when it decreases, they can molt into a pupa or an adult. So keeping it artificially constant and high blocks, some, blocks insects from maturing. It can also keep eggs from hatching. Um, so what impact does this have on non-target invertebrates at these sites? And what about larvicides? Some places still use synthetic insecticides, including organophosphates for larvae, though I'm not um, aware of any of that use in Boulder County anymore. But one thing I see in mosquito management programs is using more and more um, of these bacterial larvicides. And environmental organizations also really promote their use because they're trying to get people to avoid synthetic products and fogging and spraying. But it's a big mistake to assume that natural products are benign. It is, in fact, just the opposite in the case of these larvicides. And I'll talk about that when I explain the city's approach. So the approach the CDC recommends is really focused on killing as many mosquitoes as possible at every life stage. And this seems to make sense to our human brains that want to efficiently and quickly tackle a problem in a linear and reductionist way. But there's a lot of collateral damage from this approach. So what does the city of Boulder do? We have an integrated pest management policy that takes the opposite approach. So instead of focusing on killing a target organism, the focus is on managing the ecosystem by promoting the stability of desirable species to discourage pests and promote the natural balances within it. This means a lot of observation and monitoring. It also means reviewing the literature, consulting with ecologists and applying ecological principles when making management decisions. It takes patience and it's ever evolving as we learn. So this view of the mosquito life cycle is more in alignment with what we're trying to achieve. In functioning ecosystems, there are predators at every life stage. And the questions we ask are, what are the characteristics of the sites where predators thrive and how do we increase biodiversity, not only of predators, but of different mosquito species and other fly aquatic larvae like caromidids that compete with each other, as well as feeding predators. And they also graze on plankton and detritus. How can we manage our land and our wetlands to encourage as much biodiversity as possible? And what impact do management decisions have on desirable species and to the system as a whole? I'm gonna do a quick review of how the city's mosquito program came together during the highest point of West Nile. So when Colorado was hit in 2003, we had the highest number of cases in the nation and people panicked and started spraying insecticides from trucks and from aircraft. The city chose not to spray. This is before my time. Um, I came on a few years later. So traps are set in a grid throughout the city and the mosquitoes collected an ID to see if there were Culex and then the Culex sent for testing, West Nile virus testing. And there was no risk of West Nile inside the city neighborhoods based on the data. So there was no reason to even consider spraying. But I found these clippings in an old file. And I also found letters from the CDC, from the state and from the county health departments demanding that Boulder sprayed. 
but without evidence that it could help. And, you know, there wasn't a reason to spray. We didn't spray then and we never have sprayed um, for mosquitoes. Now, as I mentioned before, field techs check to see whether our mosquito larvae are culex or nuisance. And from the very beginning and for many years, the only sites that were ever treated with BTI um, were those with culex to avoid necessary, um, unnecessary BTI in our wetlands. And later under pressure um, from the county and from some recreational facilities, a few sites were added um, to be treated with BTI for, for high nuisance uh, mosquito larvae. So that was how this program was structured when I joined the city. And we made a few minor tweaks, but in 2018, we made some pretty major changes. So um, the open space and parks ecologists first categorized every one of our 550 sites as either low or high quality, and then we reviewed every site visit since the program began. I mean, we went through spreadsheets line by line, and we created a fairly complex threshold to determine if BTI could be used. We divided the sites by larval breeding history, and those that were consistent or high breeding were visited once a week, and those that were sporadic breeders were visited monthly. In addition, every site had biodiversity data collected. I did an in-depth literature review to learn as much as I could um, about the ecology of mosquitoes and other critters associated with these sites. And there are also lots of new papers about BTI. And what we learned made it even more clear that we needed to reduce it as much as possible. So here's a simple food pyramid with the planks, um, plankton, algae, microorganisms at the bottom. And when this is an imbalance, we end up with shifts that can impact water quality, the diversity and abund abundance of primary consumers and even lead to algal blooms when it gets out of whack. BTI kills mosquitoes, but it also kills chromatids and other aquatic fly larvae. And when they're pulled out of the system, it can create a shift at the base level. The, and they also there's also a lack of food um, that impacts the predators who feed on mosquitoes and flies and then cascades up the food chain. And as research shows, um, that this is actually what's happening. So I'm just going to show a sample of the many studies that continue to be published on the impacts of BTI. The mosquitoes themselves adapt, but BTI is also persistent, and since it's a bacteria, it can replicate and can be moved to other places. And long-term studies show it affects phytoplank the phytoplankton community. There are multiple studies showing it harms chromatids and other invertebrate communities. And we see cascading trophic impacts that you'd expect from all that. So by reducing odonates who feed on mosquitoes and fly larvae and bird populations that feed on um, dragonflies and other insects that are also impacted. We've lost nearly 3 billion birds in North America in the last 30 years. And we need to take these impacts from our different practices very seriously. But one of the most troubling effects of BTI is that it's, direct, it's directly toxic to amphibians at field rates. And what it does is it tears up the, their guts, as you can see in this photo. So that's normal gut on the left. And on, and on the right is the gut from a tadpole ex, exposed to BTI. I don't think BTI should ever be applied to a site with tadpoles. So we're very fortunate that our contractor is one of the best aquatic entomologists in the region. And the staff are all passionate and experienced field ecologists who do this work because they want to make a difference. So when you see one of the field ecologists applying a tiny amount of BTI, um, so here what you see is a, a field ecologist applying a tiny bit of BTI to a depression where there is um, a lot of heavy mosquito breeding. And they'll also do things like just scoop it out if it's around the margins of a, a bigger wetland. The bigger wetlands almost never have um, mosquito larvae. Are, are at least not enough to make it worthwhile to even consider treatment. And they use an aquatic net for biodiversity surveys. And here, if the, if the video is working for you guys, you can see what they find, damsel, fly larvae, all different sizes and species and different bugs and beetles. It's just like a whole um, a bunch of life happening under there. And of course, they find lots of tadpoles. And when they're just out doing their normal dipping with the, the um, cup on the end of, the, of a stick here, 
there's so much biodiversity at lots of these sites. They, here's a whole bunch of um, dragonfly nymphs. They also do terrestrial um, biodiversity surveys, so they use sweep nets, and they also record fish, birds, and amphibians. And what we're finding is that this fact sheet from Indiana's DNR is true. Healthy wetlands really do devour mosquitoes. We almost never find um, mosquitoes at sites with lots of biodiversity. And we take the biodiversity of a site into consideration before we would even consider treating at all with BTI. So as we destroy habitat and fragment, we are losing um, biodiversity at a staggering rate. We filled in wetlands and replaced it with homes and farms of millions of acres of monocultures of transgenic corn with BTI or BT in every cell with neonic coated seed. And then we spray it with a cocktail of herbicides that rain miles away and contaminate all of our surface and groundwater. And, the, and then end up with dead zones in the oceans where it drains. And we landscape our yards in monocultures of grass. And as we destroy our habitat and fragment it, we're losing vertebrates at an alarming, alarming rate. But we're also losing insects. And with climate change, we have winners and losers. And mosquitoes are winners. They can easily adapt and thrive in all these degraded environments that other insects, including their predators, and, and that birds can't. So why are we seeing a rise in mosquito populations in West Nile virus? Well, the worse it got, the more people tried to fix it and the more they treated with BTI, with oils and insect growth regulators and sprayed adulticides trying to keep people from getting sick. But we also had a, a very wet year. And so that meant more weeds and more herbicides. And doing a quick look at the literature, there are several studies showing the impacts on mosquito larvae um, from herbicides and their growth and development. And in, in, in some cases, it makes them more susceptible to pathogen infection. So how do we manage mosquitoes instead of in, in, in a way that um, can keep people safe? Well, I think that instead of focusing on killing them, which is a zero sum game, that they are winning, that instead what we should be doing is managing ecosystems. We need to restore degraded areas and use land management practices that conserve insects. So this beautiful diagram um, was created by a local artist, Faith Williams, for the Xerces Society during the Colorado Pollinating Insect Study. And here is, is the, 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 the solution to what we saw from all the destruction in the previous diagram in the Wagner paper. Here are the answers to reversing insect decline. And by doing that, we not only save insects, but the foundation of the world's ecosystems and ourselves. We need as many insects as possible to be winners during this time of rapid change. And we need mosquitoes to be part of thriving ecosystems. And it's not too late. When, when E.O. Wilson died, I saw this article. And this is something we have to keep in mind. So in closing, I want to share um, this video of one of our field techs out doing her biodiversity, and not field tech, an ecologist, a field ecologist out doing her weekly checks, biodiversity checks, as she went through a field of butterflies. And not butterflies, I mean dragonflies. Those are dragonflies. Okay, thank you for your time. And I hope that more and more people will start considering um, the, the true impacts that trying to control mosquitoes has. Rella, that was amazing. <laughs> Um, we do have some questions if you're up for it. All right. <laughs> Everybody loves you. <laughs> um, well, thanks for all the love. <laughs> and remember that mosquitoes aren't always the bad guys. <laughs> and we, we make them the bad guys by the way we try to control them. Yeah. Well, we are on the top of the food chain, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so all all blame is on us almost every time, right? Um, do you have any recommendations for presenting this idea to homeowner associations or neighborhood groups or even communities? Yeah, um, one of the things that we need to do is take this complex topic and and present it in a way that you know is more concise and that we could share as a short case study. Um, you know, people come to me and say, well, how can we do this in our community? And it really is a fundamental shift in the way that health departments um, and communities manage for mosquitoes. You know, and as climate keeps, the climate change keeps um, becoming more severe, we're going to see more and more um, insects and mosquitoes moving in. You know, insects are on the move, everything's on the move. And so we need to really not panic and stop and think about the ecology of a system before we make you know rash decisions that could you know just compound the problems that we're having you know with some of these pest insects. But you know, to go back to your question. Um, one of the things that's really really problematic are these barrier treatments that so many people use in in HOA properties and in their yards, and those are the mosquitoes without you know the the summers without mosquitoes that are advertised by Mosquito Joe and, and um, True Green and a whole bunch of companies. There's just hand, tons of them. And what they do is they go every two weeks, the entire season, and spray everything because different mosquitoes have different behaviors and some rest in trees, some rest in flowering plants or grasses, and they just spray everything. And the idea is that it's persistent enough um, that it lasts for those two weeks and it's toxic enough that when a mosquito lands on it, it kills them. So think about what that means for everything else that's in your yard and for your kids and your pets. And so that's one thing to really educate people about is, is that these things are not good ideas to use. Right. And uh, it, if it's okay with you, Rella, we, we recorded this talk and we can, uh, Post it along with the other videos on the YouTube page, and I encourage people to send that link to your communities, to your public works departments, and your uh, mosquito control agencies. Yeah, and like I said, it's it's you know when you, when you're concerned about keeping people from getting these you know really scary diseases, it, it you you have to really. Um, have some confidence that, you know, an ecosystem can take care of itself. And that may mean restoring them before you are ready, to, you know, to pull the trigger on a program like this. Um, but, you know, from what I saw, the the more and more people treated, the worse things got. And I was just alarmed when I saw some of the numbers, you know, in, in a city close to us where they were spraying every week and doing everything they could think of. And they were had incredibly high vector indexes they would have more mosquitoes, more Culex mosquitoes in one trap than we had in all of our traps across the entire city of Boulder. So, you know, if it worked um, and, and kept mosquito numbers down, then you could see the rationale behind it, but it doesn't seem to work. And, and then you add all these other issues that compound the problem. So it really comes down to biodiversity and a paradigm shift in how people think about things. Yeah, and there are actually, believe it or not, there's actually controversy among the disease ecology community about whether the biodiversity actually um, slows down the transmission of zoonotic diseases or if it's protective. And um, I think you know when you the more and more data we can get um, and studies that are done. You know, it, you know, according to the ecological principles, it should dilute or slow down the effect. So if you have a site that has five species of mosquito larvae and 20 species of chromatids, you know, they're all going to be competing for space and for resources. And that just there's just fewer Culex mosquitoes, you know, to come into contact with West Nile. So, you know, I, I really think that diversity is key to this, at least in this situation. Have you seen other 
communities use Boulder's model? I haven't, but one thing that's interesting is Wisconsin takes BTIU seriously. You have to get a permit from the state to be able to apply it for mosquitoes. And they will only apply, allow it to be applied for Culex. And so they do actually you know, look key between when, and when they're out in the field, you know, they, they, they only can treat if they see Culex mosquitoes. So that, and, you know, compared to Colorado, um, Wisconsin has like a much bigger mosquito problem as far as like um, nuisance mosquitoes and people just live with it, you know, because they're not treating with larvicide for nuisance mosquitoes. Well, thank you so much, Rella. This has been a really important um, talk. I'm so glad you were able to join us. Um, and we're going to, do you have any final important words or tips you'd like to share? Well, I, I you know, what, what, what I'm hoping is that whenever we're thinking of managing for any, any organism we consider a pest, whether it's a weed or an insect, you know that we really take the time to dig in and learn about it and observe and, um, and not be reactionary. I think that can make such a difference in, um, in, in healing the land and, and starting to reverse these really alarming trends.